Hi, I'm Mike Crusos from the .NET Customer Success Team, and today I'm going to be talking about configuration in ASP.NET Core. So when you're talking about app configuration in an ASP.NET Core app, you're typically going to be using the Microsoft Extensions Configuration Library. This is a library that provides a pluggable configuration system that allows developers to load configuration settings from a variety of sources depending on what makes sense for their scenario. It's uh, .NET Standard 1.1 based, and even though it's used in ASP.NET Core, you'll notice there's nothing ASP.NET Core specific in its dependencies. So you could use this configuration library in any app that runs um, on .NET Standard 1 on the .NET Standard 1.1 um, profile. So that would include beyond just ASP.NET Core, things like .NET Core console apps, Xamarin apps, .NET Framework, UWP. They all can use Microsoft Extensions configuration to um, do their app configuration if you like. So let's start with how you create a configuration object, how you get the settings from all of these various sources. Like I said, it's a pluggable model, so you start by creating a configuration builder. And then you have to add different providers uh, to it, which will load configuration from different sources. So here is what it looks like in a typical ASP.NET Core app. You create a configuration builder. We call set base path, which will be where the configuration object will look for different config files. And then we call these different add file add methods, which will add different providers to the configuration object. So a common one you see is add JSON file with appsettings.json as the file that the settings are loaded from. So here's some settings we're going to load. Another, then after that we see that we load configuration settings from another JSON file, this one with a name dependent on the environment we're running in. And then finally we add configuration settings from environment variables. Now the reason that we add multiples of these, even multiple of the same file format, is so that some can override others depending on the environment we're running in. So you'll notice when we add these that the, the order they're added is important because later providers, like this environment specific one, will override settings in earlier providers. So in this pattern what we have is a default app settings.json which specifies a string that we're going to display to users in our web app, as well as some logging settings and a URL of a dependent service that we'll be calling into. Then in appsettings.development.json, we define that same string that we're going to define to the u that we're going to show to the user, but with a different value. So if we're running in a development environment, we will first load the appsettings.json file, then we'll load appsettings.development.json, and this value will override this one but these values will continue to be used because they weren't overridden in our other JSON file. If we were running in apps, if we were running in a production environment, we'd look for appsettings.production.json, which I don't have here, so it would just be ignored. But you know, if we did have it, it would use those settings. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, I would encourage you to go check out the documentation out at docs.microsoft.com, ASP.NET Core Fundamentals, look for the configuration page. It's got a lot of details about how all of this works. And one of the things you can see here is the providers that are available right out of the box. You can load configuration settings from a variety of file formats, any JSON, XML, from command line arguments used when you started your application, from environment variables, from in-memory objects. Uh, we have an example of that in this other project here. If we go to startup, you can see we're adding an in-memory collection of config settings. So you just provide key value pairs of here's the setting, here's the value, and those are loaded right just programmatically. We can load uh, user secrets, which are a development time config uh, model that can be useful. We can load settings from Azure Key Vault. Or of course, because it's extensible, you can create your own custom configuration providers if you like. Now, it's actually pretty straightforward to do that. If you're interested, I'd suggest going out to github.com slash ASP.NET slash configuration and looking in that repository at how we configure some of the inbox ones. For example, here's our environment variables configuration provider. You can see there's only three files here. It starts with this this add environment variables method is, a, is actually an extension method. Uh, so if we look at that, it's just an extension method which is calling on the configuration builder that's passed to it, configuration builder add, and it's giving a configuration source. So this really is optional. You don't even have to have an extension method like this. You could just directly call configuration builder add over here add 
and pass in the configuration source of, of your choice. Now, uh, in this case, the configuration source is environment variables configuration source, which implements the iConfiguration source interface and just uh, provides the configuration provider. And this is its own interface because you may want to build that provider at runtime. And so there's flexibility here to do that. For many configuration providers, the configuration source is uh, just a very simple type that returns an instance of the configuration provider, which is exactly how it works here with environment variable configuration. Returns an instance of environment variables configuration provider, which uh, derives from configuration provider. And this is where the logic is that will actually load uh, in configuration key value setting pairs from whatever source they're coming from, in this case from the environment. And so, you know, this file, which is the largest of the three, you can see is still only just over 100 lines of code. So setting up your own configuration source and provider is pretty straightforward if you'd like to load from some sort of custom location, like loading settings from a SQL Server database or Azure Table Storage or whatever. You can pretty easily go and do that if you need to. Back to the sample app, though. We add the providers, and then we call that build to get a configuration object. In this case, it's a configuration root, but that uh, inherits from iConfiguration. Something you'll also see done in ASP.NET Core 1.0 and 1.1 apps sometimes is that we may want to add that to our dependency injection container in the configure services method if we'd like this configuration object to be available to other pieces of our application, maybe to other controllers <coughs> or things like that. You don't have to do this if you don't need it elsewhere, but it's something that you see happen. Now, once we have a configuration object, there's a few different ways to read settings from it in your application. The simplest way to do that, let me jump over into, uh, no, not there. I want to jump over to my home controller. Simplest way to do that is to get the configuration object. So here we got it out of the DI container and to just index into it using this, this index operator with the name of the key you're looking for. Now you notice in our app settings that Microsoft Extensions configuration is a hierarchical configuration model. So if I wanted to read this string, I would have to look for home controller options colon title. Um, now when you're setting configuration settings through like an environment variable or a command line argument, you would specify the names in the same way by uh, delimiting the pieces of the hierarchy with a colon. You also can delimit with a double underscore if that works better for your environment. So this will read whatever value has been configured for this particular setting name. Something else that you'll see done though is a lot of times the configuration can be rather large and different pieces of the app are only going to care about particular portions of it. So you can call configuration.getSection to read just a particular portion of the larger configuration object. So in this case, we have configuration.getSection logging, and we're passing it to the console logging provider. And that's going to come in here, and it's going to read just this portion of our configuration object and pass those settings in to be used by the console logger. Now, in your own application, you could do the same thing. You could call configuration.getSection, give the section name, and it will pass a configuration object, which is just the subset of configuration contained within that section. From that section, you can call um, get section again, or you can index into it as before. Now here, because we already are looking only at the logging section of configuration, we would just directly say something like includes, include scopes to get the include scopes value out of that configuration section. Okay, So you can access the settings directly by just indexing into the configuration with the string um, key name. You can call get, get section to get a particular section, or you can use the options model. The options model is a nice way to map configuration into a CLR object. And this can be useful if you have a lot of configuration settings that relate to a particular part of your application. So in this example, we have just this one string. But if you were to imagine there were a dozen different strings in here that configure different pieces of a particular part of our application, we might not want to read them all one at a time from configuration when we, when we go to run our application. So what you can do with the options model is in your startup class, 
you can say services.configure and you can give an, a class. And we will, and the, this ASP.NET Core configuration system will then attempt to populate an instance of that class from configuration. So, in our, our home controller options here, you can see we have something called title, which is going to match to the name of this config setting. Now, again, this is just one setting here. In the real world, you would probably have multiple settings here to really take advantage of the options pattern. But in our case, we just have one for this particular sample. So we say we'd like to configure an instance of the plain old CLR type home controller options. And we say it will be populated from this section of configuration. So we have to say which part of the configuration contains the settings for this home controller options uh, options object. So we'll say get the home controller options section and from that populate this and then when we do this it will automatically add that object to our dependency injection container. So then in our home controller we can request an instance of I options of home controller options and this will give us the object that was um, created by the configuration system. So here we're, we're saving that and then um, in this rather contrived example, what we're doing is we're just passing that iOptions um, object as the model to our view. But with an iOptions object, what you can do is you can call dot value. And if this set of options was configured in our app configuration, then the value will be an instance of that type, the home controller options type in this case. If it wasn't configured, this would just be null. But uh, if we come take a look at our view here to see how it's used, you can see that we're just calling um, dot value on the I options object and then dot title because dot value will correspond to a home controller options object. And then we just call dot title to get that property out of it. And this property will be whatever our configuration system said, or whatever our configuration said home controller options uh, colon title was equal to. So we can go ahead and try this out. Uh, hopefully I haven't messed anything up by typing in the code here. But if I just do a control F5, we'll launch our app. And give it a minute here to load. Text is a little hard to read, but you can see here we're displaying to the user that title. And it's customer sample MVC application in parentheses development. Now the reason it says development is because we are running in a development environment. If I look at my project properties, you can see that I've set the ASP net core environment, environment variable to be development. So in our startup class, when we say add JSON file app settings dot environment name dot JSON, that's going to be app settings dot development dot JSON. And here you can see is that string, which was given to us in a, an options object to be used by our controller. Now if we were to go back to here and we have, let's say we change this to production. Now instead of loading app settings.development.json, we'll load app settings.production.json, which in our case doesn't exist. And so we'll just be using the default value out of app settings.json. Now this just as easily could be configured by setting an environment variable, a command line argument, etc. if we'd set that up uh, in our configuration builder. So here, you can see we have the same page, but now that string just says customer sample MVC application because that's the value of the string in our non-development uh, configuration. So that's a quick overview of how the configuration model works in ASP.NET Core. One thing to note is that this is changing a little bit in 2.0, which will be released later this quarter. So this is the common pattern for ASP.NET Core 1.0 and 1.1. When you start using ASP.NET Core 2.0, Consuming configuration settings is going to be more or less the same. You'll have the options uh, pattern, you can index into a configuration object, you can get a section, all the same things we were doing here. But setting up your configuration object is going to look a little bit different. Uh, let me hop over to an ASP.NET Core 2.0 app to show you. The main difference is that you'll notice we're not configuring it in startup anymore. We're not setting up a configuration builder. Instead, that happens in program.cs when we create our web host. At the time we create our web host, we can call dot configure app configuration, and that will get a context and a config builder, 
And then with that config builder, in here we can do things like add any file, add environment variables, add JSON file. Now in this model, there's always an iConfiguration object available in your dependency injection container. In the 1.1 model, we had to add it. In 2.0, it's automatically there. But when you create your web host, if you configure app configuration, you'll be able to modify that object in the dependency injection container to have whatever providers you need. Now, you may notice that this was commented out because in a lot of cases, you won't even have to explicitly set up your app configuration because we've got some defaults built in. There's this new helper method called create default builder that makes setting up a web host a lot simpler in ASP.NET Core 2.0. One of the things that create default builder does for you if you choose to use that method is that it will automatically create, in fact, let's just go look at the source code because this is all open source now. You can see it out at uh, GitHub ASP.NET meta packages and look for webhost.cs. One of the things it does is it will call configure app configuration on your behalf and it will add a JSON file called appsettings.json. It will read config settings from there. It will read config settings from appsettings.environmentname.json. If you're in development, it will add user secret. It will add configuration settings from user secrets. It will also add configuration from environment variables. And if arguments were passed, it will add configuration from the command line. So this, you know, JSON, a couple of JSON files, environment variables, user secrets, and command line covers what the majority of ASP.NET Core apps were loading config settings from anyhow. So if this is all you need, then to use configuration in ASP.NET Core 2.0, you just call create default web, create default builder. Then on the builder that comes back, you call you startup with your startup class. You're good to go. Configuration has been set up for you, and an iConfiguration object is available in the dependency injection container. So you can see here in startup.cs, instead of setting up the configuration builder, we just request iConfiguration in our uh, constructor so that we'll get it via dependency injection, and then we're able to use it in here the same as before. Controllers can also use it by requesting it from DI. Um, if you would like to use create default builder but they're not loading your custom configuration provider to get settings from you know SQL server or something it's not a problem you call create default builder that will call all of the defaults and then you are able to call configure app configuration on the um, web host builder that comes back and this will augment what was already done in the default uh, method so you know, if you just need to tweak it a little bit, call create default builder, then call configure app configuration to add additional providers. And if you just totally need something different, well then skip create default builder, create the web host builder yourself, the same way you would have in ASP.NET Core 1.0 or 1.1, but make sure that you're calling configure app configuration here to set up your configuration instead of having to go do it in startup.cs. Makes the configuration available earlier in your process, and it automatically adds it to the dependency injection container so that you can easily get it. Again, these changes are coming in ASP.NET Core 2.0, um, and it's just about how you set up the configuration object initially. Using it is all still the same. You can see that down here, um, actually I don't think we even use it in this sample, but were we to use it, it would be used exactly as it is in, in 1.0 and 1.1. Again, the documentation is all available out on docs.microsoft.com, and they cover everything I went over in this video, plus more.